investigating a story about a classified government program. What you're saying is that you were a, a psychic spy. A Jedi warrior. You will be a psychic weapon. Feel it, yeah! We don't fight with guns, we fight with our minds. Jedi, huh? Hi. How are you going? You're a great speaker. I, I always enjoy your um, conversations with people, and sometimes, you know, I was watching these. Um, they sound like probably should probably should do a vanity search just to see what's out there. You know. <laughs> Well, one of the big problems, of course, is people hear what they want to hear, not necessarily what you said. That's it. And and people like us who think a lot, you you make a whole lot of series of connections, but the other person maybe is not, they haven't got the stuff in the centre, so they don't quite know what you're getting. Yeah. I was talking earlier to uh, my cousin and uh, mentioned that we were going to have this talk and Ip Man and that, uh, you know, Gary probably mentioned his uh, 10th degree black belt in yeah. Ishan Ru. And he was the North American champion starting you know, over half a century ago. Wow. That's pretty amazing. So anyway, when I mentioned Ip Man, he goes, oh, yes, that's Bruce Lee's instructor. Well, that's that's one of the thrilling things for me with our style is because all the Chinese guys that uh, I look up to, they all actually knew Bruce Lee. You know, they were they were in his school and um, saw him as an elder brother. They were always young fellows just starting oh. out. But um, yeah, you know, your you, it was your cousin. You said, yeah, Gar Gary Alexander. Gary Alexander. Wow, that's I mean anybody who's Tenth Dan, that's <clears throat> that's really like stellar level. Yeah, no, he yeah, like I say he's been a grandmaster for uh, quite a while. Um, started in what is sixty two. Um, became a, a champion. His G whiz figures were a thousand matches, full contact, undefeated. Incredible. He's like he, he's like he hits really really hard. <laughs> you can find stuff on uh, Black Belt Magazine uh, with both of us, and I've written. A, what, what's amazing about this actually ties into some of these other things. Uh, he and his brother had rheumatic fever uh, growing up and spent two years in bed. Wow. And uh, recovered, and then he went to the Marine Corps, and then when they were in Okinawa, had picked up the Ishinru, which is a Okinawan style. So was he in Okinawa in the 60s? Let's see. It, it may have been the late 50s. Wow. Probably around that time. He's, he's almost identically just a few months younger than I am. And uh, yeah, I, I entered the military in 56. Mm -hmm. So we've been pretty close to that time frame. Yeah, well, that's <clears throat> a lot of the legendary uh, characters in martial arts, like Chuck Norris, for instance, st started in the military. And um, I think Chuck was in Korea. I'm pretty sure I remember that. He started out and, and a number <clears throat> of guys I've read their bio. Well, my first instructor was Henry Slomansky who had spent years in Japan and had a MOS, military skill, as a hangman, actually hung the Japanese war criminals. <laughs> Just a little. By the way, he ended, after he retired, he ended up becoming a chaplain uh, in, in a hospice yeah. organization. Yeah, a broad spectrum there. It sort of makes sense, I guess. Anybody's done something so radical that 
it's very much the yin and yang of life, isn't it? The, um, it, the depth of darkness and horror can often bring great uh, love. No. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, it's, you know, as I said in my last interview, it's it's such a an honour to speak to you. And, and um, I, was, I was thinking last night that, that I, I mentioned this too, that this is sort of like a box set, but that movie Push, Push. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I that it was the documentary with you in it at the end of that, right. which I suppose it was about seven years now ago. But I, I, it was you, it, it was you and your testimony and who you were that made me take serious my own experience. I, I went right. If if this man says this is real, as we say, fair income in Australia. If John Alexander says this is real, then it's real. And I'm going to take, take myself more seriously and start, you know, really trying to develop further and look into this. And, you know. Well, I'm not sure that that makes it real, but it, uh, you know, the events are real. And we're battling, it's interesting, I was on the internet, and this has to do with the UFO naysayers who were saying, oh, this is just silly. It wasn't. And one of the things they do, I've seen several where they've been looking at these videos and then they come up with some minor explanation of how that video would have been shot. Yeah. And, you know, I'm saying, you don't understand that. Is, the videos are just confirmation. They're not the, the evidence per se. This is multi-sensory, you know, from electro optics to IR to acoustics to you know magnetic to you know every sensor system picks it up and it happens to be that we they got some video that confirms what they were seeing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well that that was great what you just said because the the level of sophistication of the United States Navy, you know, I've I've had friends in the Australian Navy who told me a few things. They said, this is not exactly classified, but this is the sort of stuff we can do. And this is back in the 80s, they were telling me, I was like, wow, uh, I can't even imagine what that's like now. Well, the, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to shoot a program with George Knapp uh, tomorrow morning, as a matter of fact. Uh, George is a key figure in this. Um, and has been for years one of the major players. He is local Channel 8, uh, our CBS local affiliate, uh, very well versed, has been in, deeply involved in all of these studies for decades. Um, and then you know, kind of long and involved in, institutionally, uh, I, I I'm not sure. I think he's now just working part time, but the um, you know how our TV stations have got hooked up into big well, networks, if you will. You know where various companies own quite a few of them, and I think it's Nexstar that that his was under. But they started putting out this thing called Mystery Wire, and. Um, George runs that himself. He um, and in there you will find years and years of interviews that he has done with key people through throughout the thing, and uh, yeah, a lot of pretty amazing stuff there. Oh, thanks. I'll check that out. I I have heard his name, but I I remember we were living in an area where we had very poor internet for quite a long time, and then we've moved into our new house probably five years ago, we suddenly got blistering fast internet and I started YouTube binging. And at that stage, I was still like, well, maybe I, 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 I dig sci-fi, I dig, you know, Star Wars, Jedi's, all that sort of stuff. Mm. It would be so cool if, if flying saucers were real. And then I found um, serious disclosure with um, uh, Stephen Greer, uh, but what oh. what really took me was this all these you know a couple of hundred interviews he did with uh, older ex-military guys, you know guys going right back to the Second World War, 
people, you know, with all sorts of experiences just talking on the record from the 90s. And uh, I think it was testimony that was presented to the Congress uh, late 90s, early 2000s, but that riveted me. And because I have a little bit of military background myself, I thought, now these are people I can actually believe. They're obviously got no reason they're in their 70s, 80s, 90s. There's no reason for them to come out with a whole lot of tripe like this at this stage of their life, have a you know, good life. Um, so they convinced me that there was something real going on. And, um, yeah, I, I think obviously at the moment we're at a bit of a, I see the media is really revving up their Australian media just made a, an hour long documentary about, um, you know, the, the situation with these UAPs flying around the U S Navy. And also we had a, a major event in 1966 called the West Hall incident down near Melbourne. And I've followed that for a few years, but they sort of, this journalist revisited all these people and, and this, uh, the teacher who came out and saw these objects, it was a large cylindric, uh, cigar shaped, what I guess was the mothership and there was three other craft. And they actually landed and the kids went and ran out of the school into this. Okay, big yeah, I, I've heard about that. Yeah. I remember yeah. the about those kids coming out of school and uh... Similar, there was another case like that in uh, South Africa. Yeah. As well, it was on... Uh, that Zimbabwe? Yeah. Yeah, that, that one really made the hair stand up back of my neck. Those innocent little kids, you know, African kids and real little... Well, sort of... you say African, some of them are actually, at least now, Australian. Is that right? Yeah, yeah no, I met um, James Fox created a movie i forget it's it's now out you can find it forget the name of it it was that when they were filming it it was going to be 701 um and they actually brought in uh, a number that of course are adults now but uh witnesses who had been the kids in the school and i remember some of them had been come in from uh, australia all right i think a lot of People from South Africa came here because we were a very similar sort of people, you know, where like it's like a hot country, Southern Hemisphere, English speaking, sort of a uh, bit Wild Westy, you know, our, our attitude. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're not totally civilized here. And, I'm uh, sorry? We're not totally civilized here. Yeah. We, uh, we sort of grow up running around barefoot and Sleeping on the ground. Well, I thought uh, one of your big cases down south, or was that from Adelaide, where um, uh, you had the uh, pilot flying south to Tasmania? Yeah, Valentin. Um, thing comes over and picks him up, and still have never heard from him again. Is that, yeah, that, he, that was out of um, Point Cook, which is. I'm pretty sure it was Point Cook, but he flew across to Tasmania or to King Island, which is on the way to Tasmania. But he was actually an Air Force cadet, like Air Training Corps, RAAF, you know, Royal Australian Air Force, the same as I was, pretty much at the same time. Like I could have, he became a pilot officer. I could have gone on to be that without actually joining the Air Force. It was more like a reserve position. And I'd done the sort of flight training. He'd actually gone on, got his license. But, um, yeah, so I've always felt an attachment to that guy. And it was a weird story that, and I've never been able to get quite to the bottom of it, but a farmer apparently reported seeing a UFO. He, he was on his tractor out in the paddocks. This craft was flying, and on the side of it was stuck the Cessna. And he took down, he scratched the, the aircraft number on on his tractor and the craft flew away but this Cessna was stuck to the side of it like magnetically or something and uh, took off and and this was in some of the major papers about mm -hmm. a year after this happened but I I cannot find anything further about it um, 
people say, oh, we'll reveal this, we're going to find this farmer, but I, I haven't been able to find further. But the, the, the actual, the, the, the tape of the um, of air traffic control speaking to him is really quite riveting. And, um, yeah, you can, you can hear the fear in his voice and he's, there's something orbiting above me. And then he says, it's not an aircraft. And it's, you and I know that these ideas about these things being drones or the Chinese have, it's like, that's just insane. <laughs> like, yeah. you know. Yep. If, if this were Chinese or Russians or whomever, anybody else, and I think we may have discussed, but it's all time. It's not about little widgets flying around. It's that you understand a fundamental different source of energy. Yes. And that changes the geopolitics of the world. Absolutely. It's just ridiculously far above us. And I don't, I, it's always puzzled me why people could even countenance such stupid ideas like uh, the Bentwaters incident. You know, these sceptics were saying, or the bunkers were saying, oh, they must have seen a lighthouse. It's like, for me, as an ex-policeman and, you know, somebody who spent his, a lot of years patrolling in the night, you don't mistake Venus or a lighthouse for something. It's like, what? Well, actually, Chuck has gone back and went there and they went to the location and they finally said, oh, you can't see the lighthouse from ah, here. Right. <laughs> it's physically blocked. You know, yeah. They were talking about the periodicity uh, of the light moving. So there it is, there it is. That, that's what led them to that uh, hypothesis. Uh, but there's so much in that, in that, uh, as Chuck said, no, this is a later incident and he's out there and you've got something that's manipulating through the woods and splits into pieces and go zipping off in five different pieces, and then two of them come above them and shoot a laser beam at his feet. Uh, not a lighthouse. Yeah, it's, it's just absurd. The um, yeah, that's when you say Chuck. That's the commander of the base. No, he was the um, American. The base was a joint UK-US base. And it was run by UK since you're, you know, in England. And he was the American deputy commander uh, of the base. Okay. So, and, but he's the man that um, you see in the documentaries. Uh, well, he's one of them. But, yeah, he's one you hear uh, that actually had the, made the recording in real time. Right. And then you hear some of that, and that memo uh, came out. <clears throat> they also, it was with uh, uh, Chuck that uh, in his house and saw the plaster cast, because when this thing landed and you're in, it's in December, grounds frozen, and you had very definite indentations about this deep. Mm -hmm. uh, three points where it was landing, which gives you some indication of the weight that must have been involved. Yeah. And they had the presence of mind the next day to go out and actually make plaster casts uh, of the indentation. And, uh, the, uh, they split them up. I don't know if Peniston's got one, or I know Chuck Holt has, uh, yeah, the one that I saw. The, yeah, right. Wow. Well, that's that's fantastic that you you know him. Um, I that was another thing when when I saw him, I thought this guy's the deputy commander of a U.S. nuclear base on in Britain, and you don't believe him. Why why would you not believe this man? I mean, this guy's got the highest level of credibility. And well, the, the the interesting story there was I I met him years later after I had actually retired. I was working at Los Alamos. And we set him up, uh, we agreed to have lunch. And he says, he, people ask him, how much debriefing was there? And he says, no, nobody ever debriefed me. But since I was from Los Alamos and going to come to see him, he thought, ah, here, the debriefing is finally coming. So quite surprised when I'm going like, no, tell me what happened. <laughs>
And of course, you see, at the time, the sensitivity was that it was not generally known. Now, obviously, the officials in the UK and MOD knew that it was a nuclear storage area, but that was not known in the general public. Yeah. It was actually the most forward nuclear weapons storage area uh, in Europe wow. uh, between us and the Soviet Union. And so, obviously, extraordinarily sensitive. Yes. So, was it um, ICBMs, or did they were they stored? No, 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 no. This, this is, they go on on bombers. So it's like a cruise missile type thing. Well, actually, it was actually bombs at, at that point. Uh, even in the 80s, they were still going to drop. No, bombs. we we did have. You know, this was the new part of the nuclear triad. It's, you have submarines with the SLBMs, and then you had your ground launch ICBMs that were stationed here, mm -hmm. but then you also had ones that were transportable by uh, aircraft, and uh, that's what, what these systems were. Were they to be dropped by B-52s, or was there something more advanced? No, you, you didn't need a B-52, and that's why they were closer there, so. Other other bombers uh, could get it, or uh, potentially. She, you know, the stealth fighter F one seventeen never was a fighter. I mean, that, that was part of the myth once once it came out. Wow. The idea in the one seventeen stealth when it was designed was to be nuclear capable, and to have the ability to decapitate. Uh, the Soviet command and control structures. Okay. So see, they could, I mean, yeah, the Soviets had an advantage in Europe because they're fairly close. So the lines of communication, you know, supplying the forward troops and all that is, is a huge advantage. Yes, we had Pumpkus stock, lots of weapons and things that were stored there, but you got to get a there and pick it up and then get to the front and whatnot. Whereas the, they, of course, had the Eastern Bloc countries and whatnot ready to, to go. <clears throat> so we also knew that, that their war plans were to push, you know, the, it wasn't Soviet troops first. Yeah, they were going to offer up uh, the, the Poles and Czechs oh. and, and, and all of them. And then the Soviet forces uh, come behind them with, you know, a huge number. I mean, the numbers are just, uh, we like to say um, they had uh, uh, to assure us. He says there's not one ten foot tall Russian in any of their 180 divisions. <laughs> we had 12, <laughs> you know, 12 to 18, depending on on the times and this for for reference. So the idea uh, was that the stealth bombers would be able to go in and decapitate the command and control structure uh, and chop it off what you could do quickly. And hence, things were forward deployed to get there more quickly. Right. Wow. Yeah, that's um, extremely interesting. And I, this is just an aside, but when I was a little mm -hmm. fellow, that one of the reasons I joined the um, RAAF as a cadet was because I saw the Vulcan bombers or well, the one Vulcan nuclear bomber in 1967 came out to Australia, the British, you know, Avro Vulcan, and flew around one of our major air bases, Ambly Air Base. And that was pretty impressive stuff, you know, the, the roar of that thing. And that was that early. End. Well, the flip side is you had New Zealand who, you know, refused to allow the Navy to dock. Mm, yeah. yeah. That, that they was... wanted to say nuclear free yeah um just getting back to bent waters for a sec i i just the thing that really grabbed me because i've seen, i've heard it in other stories is this control of light that these um anomalous objects often they seem to have like a 3d light as if it sort of just can stop the lights as if it's solid and um I'm just wondering if you've come across that much because I've heard it in different, um, like, uh, 
There was a, a documentary just recently in this town in the States where there was a whole rash of quite amazing visitations in the, it was the late 60s um, when all these, they interviewed all these people who were children at the time. And um, one particular guy talked about him and his mother going across one of those old-fashioned American bridges with a sort of a, like a roof and seeing this craft and the craft was like rippling as if it was like a turtle. It was sort of orange and brilliant white and there was this light that sort of came out but it stopped and it really struck me as just a, one of those magical technologies so far ahead of what we understand that you can't really get your head around it. And I remember thinking this is why people struggle to say what they saw, I think, because it's so different to normal just light or... You know. Well, that's true with a number of the phenomena where you ask people to describe it and it's ineffable and... You're trying to best take words that you think might fit. You know, uh, explain it to people who have no idea what you're talking about. So. Yeah. And I, I often look at, um, you know, I don't know about your system over there, but we have very little drawing training in our educational system and we, we haven't really had it for a long time, since before the 70s, I'd say. So most people can't draw, you know. Most adults draw like little kids. Yeah. And I often <laughs> notice witnesses, they do these drawings and I think, oh. That, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guilty. Yeah, well, it's just it's just oh. the system. I see you have friends there. Oh, that's my big fella. My, my I just saw somebody going to come up there. He's emerged from his cocoon. But... Um, um. As a trained artist, I often think, oh, man, I wish I'd seen it. I'd, I'd, you'd get a drawing that would blow your mind, you know, because I can, I can draw anything and I can remember stuff and I notice details. But the first thing... Uh, just a second. You, you stalled there for a while. Oh, I, I was just saying, am I stalled now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, to go ahead. Um, yeah, I can, I can, as a trained artist and illustrator I can draw really anything and I often think if only I could if I could see something up close I'd be able to really draw it uh, in detail and I'd do it straight away you know I'd fresh memory as soon as I saw something I'd grab paper quick give me paper and I'd draw it and um, one of the most remarkable um, incidents I found I, I'm very interested in Australian accounts going back to the, the 40s and 50s about, you know, flying saucers slash UFOs. And there's a heap of them. And we, there's a whole big archive of uh, old newspaper clippings right. online. And I found this amazing one. This this gentleman in ni about 1965, he... Um, in a city, Sydney, near where I used to live there, um, he was out, he heard all these dogs howling at about four in the morning, he was out for an early walk, and he saw this object land on the beach, and it was just near where my wife and I used to live when we first met, and this guy had been in the um, RAF, you know, Royal, Australian, Royal, uh, Royal Air Force in Britain, as an illustrator and his whole job was drawing aircraft. So this guy knew how to draw and he knew how to draw flying things and he drew this thing he saw on the beach. And as soon as I saw it, I went, now I trust this guy, that, that is exactly what he saw because I look at the way he's drawn, I know how he's thinking and um, it's got shading and it's just a sketch, but it's a beautiful sketch and uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think people should learn to draw so they can draw UFOs. <laughs> Just, um, I, you know, I, I've got all those questions I want to ask you about powers and things, but I'm really enjoying talking about this. I, I just, could you elaborate a little bit more on what you think of what 
what you think this phenomenon really is? Because last time we talked, you sort of indicated that you thought more than being extraterrestrial, they could quite possibly be, I might have got you wrong, but either us from the future. Well, uh, let, me, let me ask you a question. And specifically, which phenomena are you attempting to address or do you want me to address? Um, right. Well, I guess there's so many, so many different craft and things that happen to people. Um, I suppose most relevant would be what's happening now with these Tic Tacs and these uh, cube shapes with, you know, balls in them. And I, I saw these flying pyramids that just blew my mind. It was, it was a short clip, but these high altitude pyramids and it was, yeah. I don't know if you've heard of it. There's a, there's a funny Kung Fu film called Kung Pao. It's a sort of a, you know, a piss take of Chinese Kung Fu movies from the 70s. And they have these flying pyramids. Well, as I say, one of the major problems when you even discuss UFOs is when we say, what do you mean? And I think I mentioned we've got little balls of light and I've got craft literally miles across. And the other problem that you're alluding to here is the thousands of variations that are in between. And see, that's, I think, one of the problems where the skeptics get involved is they try to solve one of these, you know, and say, ah, I can figure out this. When I was talking to a reporter this morning and it was, it's so much broader. Uh, you know, we get fixated on um, the each is, is it a tic tac? Is it Jacks or Patty? Is one that's on that or gimbal or the triangles or whatever? I'll tell you the thing that I don't have an answer for and what's going on currently, and that's um, is this something that's unique to the U.S. Navy? I, I know the Air Force is less than helpful on this report that's coming out. <clears throat> really don't want anything to do with it. Um, but if, if it's our Navy, I, my assumption would be that this is something that's showing up in other navies as well. And not just Navy. I mean, part of the issue is, you know, the military. Um, and I have come down, well, uh, talking about this issue of threat, you know, this goes back to what we had the Condon report, uh, 69, that says not a threat. Well, there hasn't been an invasion. Mm. There have not been any hostile actions taken by any of the craft that, that we're discussing there. Certainly interaction, control, uh, knowing, for instance, uh, when Favor said, you know, this thing disappears and goes to his rendezvous point. <laughs> so they fly out there and the, the widget's already there. I know, that blew me out. Um, so uh, the, the question for me is how unique is this? And now uh, we know, that, I mean, what we'll, we've just finished discussing a whole bunch of civilian incidents. Um, and one of the problems here is that even the number of significant incidents that have taken place over years. Mm -hmm. and, and this is one of the things that I get into with uh, skeptics. Well, I'm going to go see this. I want to see that. And well, I did this, um, I don't know if you know Jesse Ventura, uh, a former governor uh, in Minnesota, former wrestler, et cetera. And heavy, I mean, he literally had a program called Conspiracy conspiracy theories. I remember that. And yeah, but my point to all of them is that there is no doubt that there are a number of very significant cases that have taken place. When you amortize that over a world and, you know, more than half a century, mm. it's not like things are, you know, happening on a, you know, that much of a continuous basis which makes it from a scientific perspective very difficult 
to uh, you know do analysis on because you've got various abstract events that uh, you know then come together and look for what are the common factors and what particularly what can be measured is uh, what you're interested in. Mm. Yeah, it's a huge phenomenon, and you just reminded me of um, I found a a cache of. Australian newspaper articles going back, believe it or not, to about 1830. And one of the earliest ones, around about 1830, 1840, was in this town where, and and I'm sure I could track it down again, but there was this town where there's, there's been this underground coal fire been burning for thousands of years. And... The person who wrote the article was talking about how his grandfather told him that this craft, something flying, landed near this fire and stayed there for quite a while and a lot of the animals would would go missing or be found butchered in strange ways and that these very tall people would come into their town. And this would be Australia in that time in the country was pretty much the Wild West, you know. Um, we, Where about yeah. so we talk? Yeah. Uh, New South Wales, somewhere out west of Sydney, could be up near Newcastle, I think, um, a okay. big coal mining area, and that's why the, the coal's been burning. It's just huge seams of coal. But, um, yeah, our, our past has been erased in a lot of ways, like in the States you've had you know, <clears throat> cowboy and Indian movies in the past and, you know, different in the 70s. We were trying to address what happened to the Indians, you know, much more sympathetically. And then, you know, it's been revisited the West, but we had a pretty wild time here was going on, but it was sort of hidden. You know, the, the Aboriginal people didn't just lie down. They, they fought. And uh, there was even incidences where they... They got a hold of, of weapons, you know. There was guys who worked. They were extremely, extremely uh, talented people, especially with tracking. Uh, so the police used Aboriginal guys to track other Aboriginals or hunted criminals, you know, anybody. that They just could almost magically follow somebody, but they also uh, would work cattle and, and sheep, and then sometimes, you know, because of things that happened to them, they they would um, go outlaw, get a hold of some weapons. So there was quite a bit of this Wild West type stuff going on that we we it's always been suppressed here. You know, it's been hidden, and um, so it was that sort of period, a Wild West type period, and these these tall, really tall strangers would come to town and buy supplies. And they were dressed oddly. And, you know, I, I remember reading it thinking, well, wow, there's really a science fiction movie in this, you know, these these people. And, and there's just many stories like, you know, from I think the earliest one when now I think about it was from about 1790 when Australia was very first settlement. You know, things flying across the sky and hovering, huge lights and they try to describe it in what they knew, calling it electrical, look like an electrical storm, but it's stayed in one place and trying to find words for it. So, yeah, the, um, the range of this phenomenon, it goes back a long way, which sort of, maybe don't mind me segueing into something. Um, I, I didn't actually ask you about whether you wanted to talk about this, but I'll ask you now if you if you you don't want to talk about it, that's okay, but the, the, the ancient alien idea, the, the idea of visitation way back, you know, thousands of years ago, perhaps biblical stories, perhaps the Sumerian epics, um, Gilgamesh, Thunderbirds, all that stuff. Um, could I get some of your thoughts on that? Like, uh, I, I sort of like, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, you do have these... I mean, stories that go into antiquity, and many are legends, as we say now. Um, 
a strange story, but this uh, weekend I bumped into a movie, uh, actually an old movie called The Heart of the Sea. And uh, this has to do with the legend of Moby Dick. Turns out the damn thing was based on real incident. Wow. Uh, whale did take on the Essex, and uh, this was a whaling ship and attack it. And it was just amazing how much of that and then as the movie goes, uh, there's a, the lone survivor, you know, many years later, others had survived, but was telling the story to Herman Melville, who then writes the story called Moby Dick. But it, it had frankly not dawned on me that, uh, you know, these uh, stories like that are based in some fact. Where it applies here, of course, is the question of, you know, what is the are the facts uh, that led to the various uh, thing. Well, look at the Upanishads, you know, in India, and the talk of, you know, Bimba. war between the gods and things flying, and uh, the question of whether there actually was at Mahendradaro a, a nuclear blast of some kind. Um, you know, Quetzalcoatl in uh, uh, South America, it, well, in uh, Mexico, where you know he flew off and his heart became a star. Sounds an awful lot like a rocket ship uh, going up. Um, well, you know, the question becomes: Are these all figments of some, you know? creative imagination uh, or at some point are there certain aspects of it that are grounded in re reality mm. the, the difference now I think though has to do with uh, uh, the information technology I mean you know what 50 years ago we would never have had this conversation That's it. <laughs> it's just you know, couldn't uh, couldn't take place. Um, uh, we had talked about Jimmy Chan and the first Earth Battalion stuff we had done with ARPANET, uh, which was a transition from from the military perspective. If we wanted to coordinate a paper around the world, basically you're talking weeks to months. Yeah, because you had to physically send it out. Blah, blah, blah. And we did the first one in 24 hours, which was absolutely unheard of uh, at the time. Now it's a norm. Yeah. Um, but with that has come, you know, this great proliferation of bullshit. You know, that just, <laughs> and just drives you crazy. Yes, absolutely. It's, um, it's a two-edged sword, isn't it? And I, you know, as a, as an artist, I for over 20 years I've been into Photoshop and you know digital manipulation. I, I haven't really done it with film, but I, I'm certainly really good with still images. I can pretty much fake anything. And so I, I really am obsessed with old stuff. I like I like flying saucer incidents from long ago and actually um is this the one? Uh, I, I don't know if I showed you this last time. No. Um, well, that's in Costa Rica. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, getting my, my my vanity light showing up there. But, yeah, right. that when I first saw that, I was like, okay, now here's something interesting. <laughs> well, what's unique about that picture, of course, is that they're above it shooting down. Almost all the things are, you know, you're catching something up in the in the air, and that that was a reconnaissance plane that's out that's actually, you know, shooting down, and that gives you various frames of reference because uh, you know how high, what the altitude was when they took. By the way, they didn't see it at the time. This was something that was there after they developed the film. And, yeah. But the analysis that's done from the description of Again, the altitude, the location, the time of day, the shadowing, because people were wondering, well, is this just, uh, you know, it's been manipulated or something? And the answer is no, it's real. 
Yeah, I absolutely believe it is too. And I, the thing that um, the only sceptic's explanation I've read that made me pause was somebody said, oh, it looks like a, um, uh, you know, the front of a, of a torch, you know, like a, um, uh, you know, a mag light or something like that. Yeah. And it's like, well, that couldn't possibly just get on there, you know, somebody would have to yeah. fake it. So there has to be fakery to make that happen. But what immediately grabbed me about this was the knob on the top because that, the little bump. Right. Um, that shows up in, you know, that famous photo the farmer took his wife's out in the backyard and there's like a clothes uh, Mac McManville. The McManville? Yes, yeah. I think that's it. It's And it's, so it's flat on the yeah. bottom, it's curved, and it's... Well, got... see, that's one of the things that's interesting is the consistency. You know, we have, on one hand, inconsistency, thousands of variations, and yet in other cases, you have a high degree of coincidence between this and, and some of the other photos that were taken. Yeah, and I, I noticed last night um, watching this just brand new interview of people from um, Westall in Victoria, the 66, 1966 with the kids, all these older people now, you know, they're sort of about my age, I think. Um, you know, none of them can draw well, but they all put a little bump on the top. They saw it as a dome shape, but they remember oh. that bump. And I don't know what why you'd have a bump like that on it, but what, really grabs me about this as an artist is that I look at the quality of that light, the way the light moves across the shape and it's sort of organic. Like it's, it's not the way the light plays on it is not like a super symmetric Well, it's symmetrical, but it's not the typical machine made aerodynamic thing we'd make. It's got a, a sense of form like, Little little round shapes in the shapes, and um, almost as if it's a living thing, you know. But you know, maybe I I feel like maybe these things are extremely advanced AI type things that are like a living metal, um, you know, a bit like the Terminator, that Terminator where the the living metal turns into the policeman and different things and the sword comes out of his arm that I, I sort of it's it strikes me that if you want to take the next step in technology you'd be into that you know silicon based intelligence um, maybe symbiotic with with organic but certainly the size of that thing like you know as you said they know exactly they were at 10,000 feet I think and it was like so this is going to be like 300 feet across. That's pretty big. I think one of the biggest I've heard of, um, you know, about the Phoenix lights. Yes. In that case, it, it actually the started. The ones? Yeah, but the point is, it supposedly started here uh, near Las Vegas, Henderson, Nevada, went down across Kingman, Arizona, Prescott, to Phoenix were seen in Tucson and turned and came back. Uh, you, you know James Fox? I mentioned him before. He, he's done several movies. Uh, I know what I saw and some other. He, he's the one that the new movie out that I'd recommend. Although, even though I ended up on the cutting room floor, but, oh, uh, but, uh, but I had met at, at a conference. Uh, he was there with a woman. And um, she had been just as down near Tucson and on I-10, our interstate highways, and talked about an object above her. And they're flying, uh, flying. They're, they're driving at uh, probably over 80 miles an hour and were under it for over a minute. Wow. So they were, they were sort Big. of like chasing it. Yeah. Yeah. Big, really big. 
So how big do you reckon? Like it, like kilometers? Well, we did hear there was another one we had from Nids uh, talking to some uh, Indians in um, uh, New Mexico, and they were in an uh, area where they have the masons. You know, the escarpment goes up very high, and that. And uh, these kid, they, they were teenagers, were out driving. And said, saw this craft come over, and it it extends again. You've got the valley in here and up, more than a mile across uh, between you know, where the mesas rise. Yeah. And this thing's flying over and over extends both sides. God. It's like something out of Star Wars, isn't it? You know, like that's yeah. sort of one of those star cruises. And the military couldn't possibly not be aware of no. something like that. There's no way in the world. I actually, yeah. I had a friend of mine. Uh, we had been at Harvard at the same time. Uh, he was military, went on to become major general. Uh, our common interest there happened to have been non-lethal weapons. And then he went on to become the executive officer for Cheney when Cheney was the secretary of defense. But he was in charge of the um, all R and D for the Air Force, and uh, met with him. And he, he knew I was interested in weird shit, and, and that was okay. And we asked about it. He says, "Okay, what's the biggest thing you got?" And basically, it was C seventeen and C fives. Um, nothing bigger than that. Uh, going across, let alone in the kinds of dimensions that we've been discussing here. Well, it's just terrifying seeing something so huge. Imagine that. I, I remember this, um, you know, Leslie Keane's book, yep. you know, Generals and Admirals Go on Record. That that also was one of the real clinches for me when I read that. I went, right, this is fair dinkum. This is actually real. But, um, yeah. She talks about, well, she got these actually written by the gentleman. Uh, this, my favourite fighter, the uh, F-4 Phantom, which is uh, born the same year as me, 1958. So I've always loved the Phantom. And this, uh, I guess, Iranian fighter pilot, Te Tehran. Is Tehran Iran? Tehran. Yeah. Where, where's Tehran? Okay. Well, that's the capital of Iran. Iran, right. He, they send him up. They, they oh, no, send yeah, him. you're talking Jafari. Yeah, he actually now General, General Jafari who went in. And there were two of them. He and his wingman were sent in. Uh, no, I use that case quite a bit. See, when I was only, by the way, you guys are running back and forth there. <laughs> I don't know if you hear him or whatnot. Oh, yeah, what is uh, uh, yeah. But um, when I was the, uh, my last assignment on active duty, I was the director of advanced system concepts uh, for the Army. And in that, I had all of the directed energy systems, um, high power microwaves, lasers, etc. And the point was, particularly with uh, high power microwaves, the issue of you know, wanting to send out a pulse where I can turn off electricity, uh, electrical, fry electrical symptom or systems. And uh, the point is directly applicable to that. I know how to turn you off. What's unique about that is this thing turns and comes back out and the systems come back up. Yeah, right. I so, say, so I know how to turn you off. I don't know how to turn you back on again. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's that's the thing that blew me out. Like his instrumentation going down. I don't think he stalled, but well, he, he sort of dropped I'll tell you what's off. the most in, most interesting aspect of that, though, as, and it's not clear, but there was a distinct change as he's going in. He's got communications problems, and he said when he went to turn on the weapon systems, that is, he was going to shoot. It had aim nine missiles there and that, uh, that that's when it went off and what we what we don't know and not quite determined is whether 
he flipped the switch, which means you've now got an electrical signal going out to acquire the target net. Or what it sounds like, it's when he thought of it. Wow. <laughs> which means that, you know, something okay. considerably different that it, it was aware of his mental intent, let alone what kind of signatures they might be projecting. And as you said before, with that, uh, those guys in the F-18s, uh, they've got that, is it the cap point they call it? You know, their, their rendezvous point. And then they went there and the thing was yeah, waiting for them. Yeah, it's already there. I mean, yeah, that it seems but, to me, obviously. But it, it you have the same point. thing there as to whether or not this is... A, Obviously, the rendezvous point was pre-established, and they may have been sending out a signal that says, you know, this is where you go to, as opposed to, did it know, you know, what your thoughts were? Yeah. And that's what directed them to the location. Yeah. Well, that's it. But, you know, the all, just about everybody who, who reports a close encounter where they, you know, were abducted or they they met them and talked to beings they always report that telepathic aspect and i i think last time we talked i told you a bit that i've had two telepathic experiences that to me were like absolutely real and right. provable because they involved other people but i wouldn't say that i'm telepathic i can't i don't i never stand there and think i know exactly what's happening in this person's mind or whatever but it seems if you were to think about how we evolve and where we could potentially go to, and especially if there is uh, sentient life in these craft and if there's something like us. Um, yeah, that's tele telepathy and, and a far greater control of consciousness would be what you'd think would be the great technology, like to fold space, you know, maybe using the mind, you know, to... Well, no. That's the thing that always gets me with these skeptics who go, yes, but we know that the speed of light's uh, an absolute. And it's like, because a guy said it 100 years ago, but that doesn't mean, you know, he was smart, but that was 100 years ago. And consciousness is the new frontier. And, and so uh, they always pick up on it, like Spielberg's um, Taken series. They sort of had these psychic sisters who come in and try to, wake yeah. the craft up and they end up dying and, you know, the thing's somehow alive. Yeah.